Welcome. If you're looking for fun and interesting things to tickle your brain and to amaze your friends, you came to the right place. This edition will focus on a topic many will find delicious. Yes, really, ice cream. Yeah, we uncovered that ice cream was very important in the survival of a nation. Nationalist China. Join us as we look at this tasty refreshment in history. Okay, Dr. Deneen, what is this craziness you've been talking about where ice cream impacted the survival of a nation for real? Well, Dr. Weaver, it's just one of the many bizarre stories that come out, come out of the Cold War. When the communists drove Chiang Kai-shek off of mainland China in 1949, he set up his government on the island of Taiwan. For many years, he hoped to liberate the mainland. Then, during the mid-1960s, his head policeman, Professor Wang Sheng, came up with a wonderful, if slightly kooky, idea. Oh, what was that? Many defectors were coming from the mainland, then undergoing the madness of the Cultural Revolution. Professor Shang believed that a demonstration of kindness on the part of the nationalist government would promote more defections. So he created the National Voucher Program, which offered new residents all the ice cream and sweets they wanted at government expense. Ah, okay. Well, we do know that it is a proven scientific fact that positive reinforcement, such as giving rewards for behaviors, apparently including defecting, uh, is more effective than coercion or punishments. It sounds like Professor Sheng was putting scientific reasoning to work. He certainly was. Do you think the culture had anything to do with this and how how successful was this, uh, as you say, sort of kooky idea? I do think the culture played an important role, and it certainly was effective. Taiwanese society was based on the moral ideas of Confucianism, which states subjects should trade obedience for benevolence. A good leader is considered a parent to their people. Also, as a devout Methodist, Chiang Kai-shek felt compassion for the victims of communism. He believed the gesture like this would prove his government's good intentions. The program was highly successful in raising the number of defections. By 20% between 1965 and 1970, believe it or not. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, uh, yeah, that's very interesting. I, I just have this kind of image in my head of all these people running around, eating ice cream, getting a sugar high, and somehow becoming convinced that their allegiance should be given based on candy and ice cream. I wonder if the position and wealth of the converts had anything to do with the success. Do you know if higher level persons or lower level persons, and I'm talking socioeconomically, were more prone to persuasion through ice cream and candy. I also wonder if there was another underlying reason why sweets were selected as positive reinforcements. That's an excellent question. It certainly wasn't the only reason. I've discovered that ordinary workers and high-ranking officials alike found this program very enticing. But the story of how these particular incentives were chosen is very touching. I imagine it would be. In late 1965, a captain in the mainland Chinese Air Force defected. He was asked why. He told Professor Sheng, I don't want to die without having eaten an ice cream cone. <laughs> On the mainland at that time, there were no treats. Very little anything in the way of pleasure. The population was struggling with purges and even mass starvation. You said this guy was from the uh, mainland Air Force. So did he actually fly a plane in or something? 
He did, and there's a very interesting story about that. Defectors that brought military equipment were actually paid tax-free rewards in gold. Oh. But over the years, the attitudes of Taiwan and mainland China itself toward each other begin to slowly change. Taiwan for many years had the avowed intent of conquering the mainland. However, as the country began to refocus its democratization and domestic affairs efforts, a greater attempt at mutual understanding took shape. Aha! It sounds like the change in focus in both mainland China and Taiwan was critical. We know that people view other nations through a lens. If they believe that another country intends to conquer them, such as actually saying that they intend to conquer them, uh, there's no room for anything other than distrust and hatred. It's rather like the childhood game of teeter-totter. That's a wonderful analogy. If you're going to play, it's necessary to believe that the person on the other end of the teeter-totter will not jump off and leave you crashing into the ground. Stands to raise it. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of what happened when Nikita Khrushchev, the uh, chairman of the Communist Party in, in Russia, said, uh, we will bury you while he was pounding his shoe on the desk at the United Nations. Oh, yes, I remember that quite well. Yeah, yeah. In, in the USA, we took this to be just short of declaring war. And this distrust fanned the flames of the Cold War. It absolutely did. But in this conflict, I think the main issue is both sides were touting the idea that they would provide a better life for their people. The question becomes, what does a better life mean? I think possessing the basics, like an orderly existence, clothing, food, and shelter, Beyond that, the opportunity to have access to cultural events and religious worship if one wishes, a sense of belonging, and sometimes something as simple, a few items of comfort, even something as ordinary as an ice cream cone, or in another case, an Almond Joy candy bar. <laughs> did they actually have Almond Joy candy bars in, in mainland China? They did, and only the Politburo and the secret police were allowed to have any. Aha, so a big incentive. A, a wonderful incentive, yes. Without these things, all of existence fades into what I call the common rubble of banality. Right, right. Okay, so mainland China probably emphasized like order, a sense of belonging, and a utopian-type dream that they would become the premier nation and be able to export Chinese culture and civilize the world according to Maoist communism. They have made great strides economically and military in many of these ideals. The Taiwanese, on the other hand, probably emphasized freedom to choose, local autonomy, a higher standard of living, and some luxury items. They have been able to deliver on many of these ideals, especially after they focus shifted from retaking mainland China to domestic improvements. You're absolutely correct, Dr. Weaver. And as we've discussed, trade is often a positive weapon in improving relations between countries. These are very simple but important lessons to be learned here, my friends. When a society is in struggle, it tends to look beyond abstract ideas to improving ordinary lives in ordinary ways. That's very important. Sometimes a minor gesture of benignity on the part of the ruler, even as something as individual and as simple as having an ice cream cone, can play a much larger role than one might think in winning over the undecided. I think this is a really interesting uh, discovery that you have made. Uh, and I, I know that people might think that this is a, a triviality and of little import or impact on international relations. Um, but the fact is, as you just uh, said, even these smaller things 
can have a very, very significant impact. It increased defections to uh, Taiwan by, you say, 20%. And I think it also changed the attitude of uh, the people in Taiwan and perhaps in mainland China too, uh, to see Taiwan's government as being more benevolent, more um, concerned about individual welfare and happiness. W would you say all that's true, sir? I would. I think you're, you're right on target. So it wasn't a waste of time then to look at ice cream as having an impact on international relations. <laughs> no, it wasn't. And I will also say it was an awful lot of fun. Well, it certainly was a sweet topic. Indeed. Okay. <laughs> well, this has been fun. And I think that we have shown that history, once again, is not just the famous and well-known things. That uh, the impact on people is often, often in the little things, the smaller things. Would you agree? Yes, I would agree wholeheartedly. I find the more research we do, the more these relatively ordinary things pop up over and over again. Yes, I, I would agree with you. And, and you know, it's, it's, um, it's always fascinating to me that every time we uh, get into a topic that uh, many might consider trivial, it explodes into meaningful uh, content. I'm continually and pleasantly surprised. Well, I guess that's a, it for today. Listen, we want to thank all, all of you for listening, and hopefully you will uh, have learned a little something. And remember, history is made not just by the famous, but by the everyday people. And nothing in history is one-dimensional. It is always a fascinating three-dimensional picture, and we hope that we have, uh, through, through these topics, we have been able to bring that to life. Thanks again for listening. Bye-bye. Have a good day, folks. <laughs>